Hi, I'm Jean, and today we're going to talk about facing reality. Facing the reality of software, facing the reality of software engineering. The first reality is this. If you talk to most software teams, they'll say something like, oh, we try to be good about integration tests, but we really don't know if a change will take down our site until production. And so while there's this theory of tests should happen in tests, all this stuff should happen before you run your code, most software teams that I've talked to effectively test in production and they either openly or secretly completely diverge from everything that we learned in school about software engineering. And so this talk is about how we can be rethinking software engineering for 2020 and beyond. The first part is about why software has outgrown software engineering as we know it. So someone said to me the other day that the 80s are as far from today as the 40s were from the 80s, which was nuts to me. I was born in the 80s, so I was like, I'm not that old, but you know, forever is the sweetest con and uh, it uh, shouldn't be surprising that a term coined in the 80s needs, uh, needs an update. So the second section of this talk is about how we're going to meet software development where it is today. So um, as you might uh, have guessed from the title of this talk, I don't believe that we should settle for testing in production. There are many good reasons to test and test, but we need to change how that looks. And so we'll talk about that. And um, if you say, well, Gene, it would be great to do all this stuff, but I don't believe it can be real. Well, I agree there needs to be new technical approaches to all of this. So the last part of my talk is about why I believe structure and observability, but black box observability is the answer to um, tooling for a new kind of software engineering. And as for why I'm here talking to you about this, well, uh, for a little bit of background, I was previously a professor at Carnegie Mellon University before I started my company, Akita. I have spent my whole life uh, programming, and then uh, I've spent all of my career going after this dream of making better programming tools for web apps, which I thought were just uh, a space that could really benefit from better developer experience. And so I had initially gone to grad school because I wanted to work on tools, but not perf. Um, I ended up writing papers on things like proving software systems correct. So my first paper ever was about proving operating systems to be type safe. Um, I worked on language design. My PhD thesis was about uh, a language for automatically enforcing security policies. And so I was, I was doing very application level stuff when I realized that modern software is like a rainforest. It's a whole ecosystem. And what I was working on was, you know, how do we make sure the feathers are okay on a single bird? Or how do we make sure all the leaves are okay on a single tree? And that stuff is very, very valuable. But I was kind of like, well, <laughs> the rainforest needs some tooling too. So let's talk about why we need to move beyond the 80s. So um, as you probably know, software development today looks nothing like software development did 40 years ago. APIs are all over the place. Um, people, um, there's, there's great ease with which people can use software that other people have written. But on the flip side, what this means is that creating software isn't about building and shipping anymore. Like in, back in the day, it was building and shipping shrink wrap software, but now it's, it's about um, operating software components. So you're taking these APIs off the shelf. You don't have very much control over them. Them, and uh, you're trying to make your code work with this code that you took off the shelf and don't have very much control over, but you can really configure a lot. So um, as you can imagine, traditional testing just really covers a smaller part of the picture than ever before. And as part of testing, I also mean static analysis, dynamic analysis, a lot of the stuff I worked on in a past life. But you know, like one of these pixelated nodes on the graph, that's like the scope of um, everything I worked on before. There's a lot of testing that now effectively happens in production with, um, with good reason because this is a really complicated picture. And then also something I like to say is there's no truth, only what happened yesterday. Because when you have something that evolved as organically as this, there's um, there's some stuff you can say like, well, you know, this thing needs to do an SMS thing. And so you call Twilio for that. But in terms of how does this perform? Um, what's the impact on this user? Like, where does the data go? There's a lot of questions that you used to have control over that you do not have the same level of control or visibility into anymore. And 
no surprise, most of our tooling was built for the other world. And so the rest of this talk will be, how do we adapt? And so if we think about, you know, software engineering lessons that gave software engineers of yay old a lot of uh, solace and a lot of order, they don't really exist anymore. So um, uh, up through, you know, when I was doing internships in college and grad school and I was, you know, in the industry, um, something that people believed in was, you know, debug with a debugger, not printf. That's what debuggers are for. Use type checkers, linters, and other analyzers to help uh, you catch preventable errors before running your code. Test your code on small examples before running on the whole thing. Well, when you're in this uh, distributed system, well, when you have service-oriented, API-oriented systems, they are distributed. They go across application. They're heterogeneous. So as a result, you're stuck debugging with logs. You really don't have much better than logs. In fact, reconciling where logs came from and what order they were made, that's already a hard enough problem. As for type checkers, linters, other analyzers, these do not exist across APIs. You might say, well, Gene, what about, you know, my GraphQL, my gRPC, my, my statically typed IDL. Um, well, I counter with what happens when you call across an API that you don't control, what happens when you call across a legacy API, which is an API you do not have very much control over. Uh, there you go. You can, you can cover a lot of the world with, um, with nice IDLs, but also uh, the lot there, there hasn't been any homogenization of IDLs. There has not been any homogenization of programming languages, and I don't expect this to happen anytime soon for reasons I will keep talking about throughout the course of this talk. And then as for testing and production, well, production is not simple. That's one of the reasons a lot of issues don't arise until then. But if we save uh, many, uh, most most of our issues for, for these complex cases where it's hard to isolate uh, any issue in a clean way, well, we're spending a lot more time testing than we could be. So you're probably at this conference because you feel like developer experience should be better and programming should be more delightful. So I probably do not need to tell you this, but what happens when developers uh, get left behind by their tools is life is very hard. So there's this nice graph on the left based on an outdated notion of the software development life cycle that I will, um, I will talk more about shortly, but basically the, the later you find a bug, the harder it is for the company, you know, the, like all these, all these diagrams are based on cost to the company, but it, it's also very, very hard on the developer. So if developers cannot figure out if a change will take down their app, so if a change will cause some sort of breakage, will cause some sort of performance bottleneck, will cause some sort of issues, then issues get uncovered later and they take longer to fix. And what this also means is that issues are more painful to fix since the context has gotten paged out. So it's not just, okay, the developer working on this bug is now working on something else, but when ops comes to dev and says, hey, you know, site's down, there's a cascading failure, like, there is no code change involved in that. Like, the code change that introduced the bug could have happened a really long time ago. All you're getting are logs of, okay, this, this network trace happened here, this thing happened here, this went down, this is still up. And so there's a lot of uh, forensic mapping that developers need to do in their heads right now, because not only is there not the context of when you wrote the bug, like the, the code and the code changes and everything that was going on then have been taken out of context. And so what this also means is, uh, you probably all know roadmaps become less predictable. Um, and then whenever things become less predictable and people want more predictability, what happens is caution. So developers use and update APIs with more caution. And I don't know about you, but I got into programming because I was like, you can write as much code as you want, as often as you want, all the time. And so if you are told to be cautious about this stuff, well, development is not delightful anymore. You're spending a lot of your time trying to find bugs. Life is just not as fun as it could be. And so now we're going to talk about how tools can do a better job of meeting software development where it is today and how we can make programming more delightful again. So we'll start by just taking down the building and shipping myth. So, you know, people are like, yeah, you build, then you ship. This is where shrink wrap software. We have not shrink wrap software for a really long time. So, you know, to 
to speak in the language of, of the young people these days, how it started was we had requirements and analysis. We had design, we had development, we had testing, we had maintenance. And, you know, this is left over from the waterfall model where, you know, we built software like we built bridges. But very quickly, people realized software is different from bridges. We can update software all the time. And in fact, we don't even need to plan what software we built. And an advantage of software is updating it all the time. And so essentially what's happened is for requirements and analysis, what is expected? behavior anymore. Software is really a process of iteration. You can build software like this, but not bridges. Um, maybe not all software, maybe not our voting machines. Side note, anyway. Um, as for design, design has become much less top-down and much more organic than ever before. Development cycles are shorter. Testing has decreased in scope because it's just honestly not as effective in, in these new kinds of architectures. And so maintenance becomes a really fun step and it's more complex than ever. And so how it's going is that development happens in a decentralized way at high speed. It's just like, you know, code flying everywhere or people want to at least. Um, at least it's uh, the development to planning ratio is, is very high. Um, testing still happens. There's still QA, but the, the scope of that is becoming increasingly limited. Um, and I think that a lot of QA has also moved to like, let's, let's test everything at the same time in a non-traditional, like using testing techniques way. Um, a lot of testing happens in prod now, um, because like the, the gap between development and prod is just like, development to prod immediately. Analysis is often now post hoc. So programming by observation is a term someone told me the other day. But you know, instead of analyzing, this is how we think our system will behave and should behave before it happens. We, uh, we watch our system after things happen and take some notes. And then uh, maintenance is full of, uh, it, it's a minefield. It's, it's full of surprises, full of places where things can go wrong. And so this is workable. Like people are surviving. A lot of software is getting created in this environment, but it's it's really not optimal. And the reason it's not optimal is, like I said before, our notion of testing was for a really different time. And uh, there have been observability observability tools that have come in and said, well, hey, look, you know, testing happens in prod now. You know, things, everything happens across APIs, but they've taken, you know, the idea of testing and then applied it to um to to this new world but in the new world like we we just do not have the control that we do we can't instrument the code we like we don't have control over certain performance things and so i um i would say it's it's high time to rethink the software development life cycle and there are there are a few things that i believe we should do for that so in terms of how it's going, well, development happens without the context of emergent behaviors of the code. Testing uh, is only able to test functions in isolation, really like the, the emergent behaviors part, really missing now. Uh, testing in prod serves many different purposes, much of it which um, I believe should be served by the development and testing phases. Analysis happens by reading through logs and traces. There, there's not very much... Uh, high level structure and high level insight that's happening there and uh, maintenance more complex than ever. So how it could be going is you can imagine a world in which development gets a lot more feedback from prod than it does today. And so right now development's just like, all right, I do some stuff. I write some code, source code, increasingly disconnected from what's going on. But what if you could get at the API graph that effectively happens instead of getting the call graph with your debugger? What if during development time you could get information from prod back? Same with test. Right now test is very limited in scope because the interconnects between, uh, between the different services, between different components is just really hard. But what if you a better way to te test that feeding data back from prod and testing in prod that can be much much smaller much cleaner you can keep the test things for tests where you can simplify things but what if prod also got fed information from from the code changes from all that stuff so you're not you're not just like looking through logs and traces you've got a little more context and so what if analysis maintenance had both the context of here's the structure we have from all of this and here's some information that we we piped all the way from development and testing which we maybe were able to do because we had that structure then too 
So this is very abstract. So I'm not going to spend very much time on it. But the high level is there's really this gap between development testing source code and then like prod. This is what really happens, behavioral stuff. Like what, what if we could have a better connection of the two and kind of pipe data across the whole thing so that we can catch issues sooner, we can catch issues better, and we can fix them faster. And again, this is really, really abstract, so I'm going to try to get concrete really quickly. But um, in my view, what it takes to bridge the test production gap is there needs to be a better way to connect code changes with behavioral changes. There also needs a way, uh, there needs to be a way to automatically help us understand the emergent behaviors across services and APIs. So right now, the emergent behavior, so like where does this piece of data go? Is there a, product, is there a performance bottleneck? Is there going to be a cascading failure? These are all what I call emergent behaviors. And these are opaque to developers until they happen. And after they happen, why they happen, they don't get like a map that's like, all right, this talk to that and this talk to that. And this is how everything fits together. Here's what's happening. It's just like, here's a dump. Here's a dump of logs. Here's a dump of traces. Um, and so can we do better there? And then finally, can we work across a heterogeneous set of components? So as I mentioned before, I believe any system of sufficient maturity, uh, there's been an evolution of tools. Like maybe GraphQL is the IDL today, but then, you know, protocols evolve, communities evolve. There's some IDL that's better in the future. Um, there's always going to be different tools. And so how do we get something that actually embraces heterogeneity by meeting the tools where they are? And so this brings me to the last and shortest part of my talk, which is how I have been solving this problem for the last few years, um, which is with structure and observability. So what I've been doing at Akita is turning API traffic into API models for insights, diffs, and more. So what Akita does at a very high, quick level is we watch API traffic across your environment. So in test, in prod, we build models out of that traffic. So these models represent your endpoints, your data types, your data formats, et cetera. And then this feeds back into development. So we give developers, here's your diffs. Here's how different APIs are talking to each other. Here's your API graph uh, is what we're building towards as opposed to your call graph. And then um, if you want to plan, developers can also feed us specs and do things there. Now I'll give a very quick demo, and then hopefully this will ground everything else I've been saying a little more. So first I'll just show the generation of a single Akita model by watching traffic. So here I have a Docker container of Akibox, a little Dropbox-like demo system. What I'm going to do is invoke Akita to listen to traffic going to that container. So there are a few ways that Akita watches APIs. One is as an agent watching traffic. One is alongside proxies or alongside browsers, which can generate HAR files from watching traffic. And then Akita also um, can integrate with integration tests by um, looking at the traffic going to the test framework mocks. So here I'm just going to send a few tests to Akibox. And so this agent can run alone, you know, standalone, triggered by you. It can run as part of CI on every pull request. There's a variety of ways that it can run. So here I show the API model that Akita generated. So Akita gives a summary of the different kinds of uh, information you might want to know, for instance, where you have bearer tokens. And then you can drill down into each endpoint for, for more information. I'm going to just very quickly make a change uh, from international to US phone number to show this is the kind of bug that people have told us causes cascading failures in the past. And it's often very hard to catch. It's very hard to catch with a typed IDL. Um, and what I'm going to do is show how we catch this using Akita. So I'm just going to make a quick commit, just a small change, no big deal. And then we're going to make a pull request. All right, here we see that Akita is done running, has left a comment on our pull request saying, look, one endpoint changed, this user's endpoint, and the US phone number was added, the international phone number was removed, and we can also see this change happen on the Akita console here. And so additionally on the Akita console, Akita summarizes the sensitive format information. So this wasn't a very long talk, but I hope what you got out of it is we need different kinds of developer tools to have truly 
good, truly empowered developer experience in this new era where software is complex, it's heterogeneous, and we're spending a lot of time operating other software. This lets us fly, but we've also given up a ton more control than we have in the past. I'd love to talk more about this, so find me on Twitter. Find me on Twitch. I have a weekly programming tools live stream there, and uh, you can always find me on the Akita beta. So if you want a surefire way to hear from me every day, uh, work on structured observability with me. Tell us how we can help you with your API breaking changes. Structured observability with me. Tell us how we can help you with your API breaking changes. Tell us how we can help you understand your APIs better.